Verse 1 says this, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. Y'all with me? Making sure Flowers is with me. All right, here we go. And was led by who? I don't know if y'all with me. Was led by? Was led by? Come on, Baltimore. Was led by? Led by the Spirit into prosperity. Is that what it says? Jesus was led by the Spirit into breakthrough. The Bible's written wrong. No, no, no. It says he was led by the Spirit into drama, into heat, into pressure, into stress. In it, and God led him there. He said, being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. The, the Greek translation for that word hungry is hangry. Right, right, right. I'm so hungry, I'm angry. He said, and the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become cocoa bread. If you understand the contextualization of Scripture, you got to read it through the eyes of a Jamaican. You ain't turning no stone into wheat bread. It's going to be cocoa bread. But Jesus answered him saying, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kings of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to them, All this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered. Somebody say delivered. Delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will just worship me, all will be yours. Hey, Jesus, all you got to do is bow down and worship me, and I'll give you the whole world. Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan. Come on, somebody prophesy over your life. Somebody say, get Behind me, cancer. Come on, can you speak to something? Get behind me, depression. Get behind me, lack. Get behind me, anxiety. Get behind me, anything that does not line up with the promise that God has made me. Get behind me, addiction. Get behind me, worry. Get, get behind me. Why? For it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Father God, we are in your presence with your people, which means you're here to speak, to transform. When you speak, we will obey. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. We are in the third week of a series called On purpose. Somebody say on purpose. Come on, I'll make y'all shout all day long. Somebody say on purpose. on purpose. The end of 2021, the Lord gave me a word. He said 2022 is going to be the year of purpose. And he says, here's what it means by me saying it's going to be the year of purpose. It is going to be a year filled with miracles, a year full with breakthrough, a year full of favor and open doors. Look at somebody and say, not for everybody. Come on, say, not for anybody. But for the people that are walking in kingdom purpose. What does that mean? It means that God has an intended outcome for every single area of your life. God has an outcome for your marriage. God has an outcome for your kids. God has an outcome for your money. God has an outcome for your ministry. Has an outcome for your career. You may have picked that major because that's what your mama told you you were good at. God knew you would pick that before you even graduated elementary school. And he formed you and fashioned you to have an impact that will transform the kingdom of God. There's a purpose to everything that you do. The only problem is, Baltimore, for so many people, they don't understand that God has a purpose for their life, so they're making it up as they go along. I'm just raising these kids to be the best that they can be. No, you are not. 
You are raising those kids to be who God created them to be, who he ordained them to be. He put gifts and talents and abilities inside of them. And as their parent, it's our job to mine out the God potential that's inside of them. And you can apply that to any area of your life. God said, this is going to be a year of breakthrough for people who live intentionally. People who aren't waking up in the morning saying, let's see where Tuesday takes me. But when they went to bed Monday night, they said, I'm going to live Tuesday intentionally because God has a purpose and a plan for it. Somebody say, I'm living on purpose. Today I want to preach a message called Detour. Detour at your own risk. Detour at your own risk. As you are living on purpose, you've got to understand purpose is like a highway and every highway has exits. That was good, wasn't it? Purpose is like a highway, and every purpose has an opportunity to jump ship. Now, you got to understand something about your pastor. God's still working on me in more ways than my wife wish he was, but I'm getting there. One of the ways that God's still working on me is I am not the most patient person on planet Earth. Pastor, the Bible says, I know what the Bible says. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It says, God is love. Stephen He's still working on me. I, I, I'm just a little impatient. I, I, I hate sitting in traffic. I will, I will, I, I, I'm not from Texas, but there's a Texas spirit on me. Because when I'm sitting in traffic, I'm looking for some medium to drive through. I don't care if there's lanes. I don't care if it's a road. I don't even have a pickup truck, but I will drive through the woods to get out of this traffic. I am always looking for a shortcut. So because I'm always looking for a shortcut, I will not drive three blocks without putting it in my GPS. I will grab my phone. I will punch it. I know how to get home, but I won't even drive home without first grabbing my phone, putting it in. It's already saved. Take me home and making sure I have the fastest route between where I am and where I'm going. I know how to get home. What I don't know is when some fool crashed their car, somebody flipped their car, somebody just looking at an accident across the road, and they're going to keep me from getting to where I need to go. So I'm going to check my GPS. Any GPS folks? You just, I just, I'm going to judge. I'm going to just, I'm going to just, just, just. I, 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 there's a lot of GPS folks. There's not a lot of people that, 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 that are kingdom-led GPS folks. You know you're not kingdom-led if you use Apple Maps. I'm an Apple guy. I'll trash an Android any chance I get. Except on Maps. It's, that's, that's not kingdom. That's not God. That's not God. That's not God at all. You know you've succumbed to a familiar spirit if you use Google Maps. Google Maps is not of God. If you're a designer, you work for Google Maps, get a better job. That's not... That's, Every woman of God, every man of God, every spirit-led believer knows that ways is the way of the Lord. Because here's what you don't understand. Every app can get you there. Only ways has discernment that will show you where the enemy is plotting your demise. Come on now. It's ways that will tell you where our great men and women of law enforcement are waiting to lead you and guide you toward your destiny. I was actually hanging out. A good friend of mine is an officer, and I was telling him this before I preached. He said, you know officers have ways, right? And he said, when I'm sitting in a speed trap, every time my picture pops up, there's a cop here, I click, no, I'm not. <laughs> I said, no way. Things you learn. I mean, I don't speed, though. It's... <laughs> if you don't know ways, you, you, it, it is of God. <laughs> but it's a little shocking for an app because ways was designed by ignorant people like your pastor. So you, fo you follow ways, you will end up driving through somebody's backyard. <laughs> Talking about this is not a road, but it's the fastest way. Just shut up and go where I tell you to go. The problem is sometimes it'll get you in trouble because Waze picks its course based on popular opinion. Basically, there's millions of people who have Waze, 
And when they click on that app, there's traffic. Waze says there must be traffic. When they click on the app, there's an accident. Waze said there must be an accident. When they click on the app, so there's an officer looking to guide you to your destination. <laughs> then Waze said there must, and their indications are all based on polling popular opinion. The problem with popular opinion is oftentimes popular opinion is exaggerated. So I'll be on Waze sometimes and I'm driving. Waze said there's traffic ahead of you. Get off here. I'm like, I can't see the traffic. I see a couple of red lights and brake lights. and Get off here. And I'll, I'll get off only to find out that what Waze thought was traffic was some drama queen who needs to put the app down and just drive. And by trying to find a shortcut based on somebody else's perception, I end up making my journey longer than it needs to be. As it is in ways, so it is in life. The longest distance between point A and point B is a shortcut. If you want to be guaranteed to get somewhere late in life, take a shortcut. Take a detour. In our passage in Luke chapter 4, there's this really confusing idea because it messes with what we were taught in church but is not biblical. You know sometimes you could be taught stuff in church that's not biblical? That's why the Bible says to be like the Berean church, to listen to the message and then after you've heard the message, go home and check it for yourself. One of the things that we've heard in church is that if you give your life to Christ, you'll be happy. Anybody who's walked with God longer than 15 minutes, they just, they just laughed on the inside. Hey, if you love God, you'll never have any problems. Well, I guess I ain't love God for all of 2020 for sure. 2021 was pretty problem filled and 2022 ain't off to a good start either. We've believed this lie that God makes life easy and that it's all kind of hunky-dory when I'm following God, which really messes with our theology when we read in Luke 4 that it says that the Holy Spirit, God himself, led Jesus into the wilderness. There are seasons in your life, flowers, that God will leave, lead you into discomfort. He will lead you into pain. He'll lead you into lack. He'll lead you into stress. He'll lead you into pressure. Somebody say, that's, that's not fun. That doesn't make sense. That's not good preaching. And I am not saying amen to that. <laughs> but you got to understand the why behind God's leading before you curse it or bless it. He tells us why he leads us into wilderness seasons of our life. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, he said this, And you shall remember the Lord your God who led you all these 40 years into the wilderness. So watch this. He didn't just lead Jesus into the wilderness. He's been playing that trick for thousands of years. He led Israel into the wilderness. Watch this. He anointed David king and then sent him out in the wilderness. You're the king. Now go out there with them sheep. He said, here's why I led you into the wilderness. This is what he says, and then this is what Stephen says. He says, to humble you. Stephen says, to beat the you out of you. I think mine's better. He said, I'm going to lead you into a place that you don't want to go so that I can humble you. Why would he want to do that? He says, so that I can test you. God, this doesn't sound fun. To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Watch this. There's nothing that exposes motives more than difficult seasons. I can't really trust your heart for me as long as I'm always making you happy. Come on now, some relationship advice. I, I don't really know. Oh, I love you. I'll see. Wait, let's see until I disappoint you. Let, let, let's see when you say black and I say white. Let's see when, when we don't disagree. Do you still love me now? Are you still committed to me now? Or was it a love of convenience? He said, no, I got to take you through some stuff so that I can beat the you out of you so I can humble you and test you to see what was in your heart. Somebody shout back at me, why? why? Because on the other side of this wilderness is something called the promised land. 
And it is above and beyond anything that you can ever ask, think, or imagine. I have so much blessings and so much favor and so much breakthrough for you on the other side of this that my blessings will tempt you to make the promise your God. So I got to take, it's, it's amazing to me when people will come to me, whether they're single or married. But pastor, I'm, I'm lonely, I'm miserable, I'm, I'm in a relational wilderness. And because I've been living long enough and see God move on, I start to get excited. And they look at me, there's nothing worse than talking to somebody who's excited when you're discouraged. I just can't, it's just not working out. My, my business is not prospering. Wow, I'm excited for you. Did you not hear what I just said? It's not working out. Well, here's what I know. I know that your life is in God's hands. And if your life is in God's hands and your life is not working out, it must be because God is working on something. And if you're walking through a difficulty, it means he's humbling you and he's testing you because he's getting ready to bless you. And he wants to make sure that when he blesses you, that you don't make the blessing your idol. So I know it's difficult. I know it's stressful. I know it's overwhelming. But hang in there because there's a promise on the other side. Somebody say wilderness. And it's in the wilderness that the enemy will always come to you and say, I can get you out of this. I know God led you into this, but I can get you out of this. I know you don't want to be in this situation. Somebody say, make it practical. There will be a season of your life where your career is not leading in the direction that you want it to go. And the enemy will bring you a job offer via LinkedIn. Oh, I noticed your performance. How'd you notice? You don't even know me. Everything I do is classified. You can't know what I do. <laughs> you, not me. Anyway, he will bring you a way out. Uh-oh. 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 Sheldon, stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble, man. Stay out. Marriage ain't working out. I can't deal with her right now. So I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out. You go to gym and work out at one in the morning. The enemy will make sure that there is a shortcut. I need Jesus. He will always make sure in the most stressful, painful seasons of your life, that there is a way of escape. And people of purpose have already made up their mind, I will not take the easy way out. The only problem is if you think living on purpose is easy, then the second and easy option, there, there's no easy button of destiny. There's no shortcuts to purpose. It's painful and it's worth it. I'll give you three thoughts, three thoughts. First one is this. Detours have three forms. Detours have three forms. Here's what you have to understand, that the enemy has no new tricks. What he's doing today, he was doing yesterday, he was doing a thousand years ago, and he'll do until Jesus returns. So if I can figure out his M.O., I can know how he will come. Here's the problem with Christians. We believe in Halloween too much. So we believe when Satan comes, he has a red tail, a cape, some fangs, and a horn. So unless it's overtly demonic, we don't think it's the enemy. What do I mean by that? We think everything that is of the enemy is egregious sin. Make sense? If it ain't Illuminati, it must be God. I'm good. The Bible says, no, he masquerades, he, he conceals himself, he, he hides himself in a good idea. But he only comes in three ways. Here's how he came to Jesus. He said, if you're the son of God, clearly you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. He said, if you do it my way, I can make you feel better. One of the ways the enemy will try to get you to detour your destiny 
is by offering you something that will make you feel good. You don't got to put up with that. Just give them a piece of your mind. Let me. Now you gave them a piece of your mind, and guess what? You feel better. Glad I got that off my chest. Yeah, and what good did you do? Did you make any progress? Did you come any closer to agreement? Did you even make a decision? No, but I feel better. Okay, let me know how that works for you. Second thing he said is, hey, come up on this mountain. He brings up on the mountain. He said, look at the entire earth. He, he said, everything that you see, Baltimore, was delivered to me. He said, I control everything in the earth. And can I mess with your head? Jesus was standing right there, and he did not correct Satan's statement. Which means that Satan told the truth. Hmm? Satan didn't say, I took the earth. He said it was delivered to me. When was it delivered to him? In Genesis chapter 3, where God took Adam and Eve, and he said, let us make man in our image, and he put them on the earth, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth and take dominion, because the earth belongs to mankind. And then mankind said, I want to be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan said, if you want to be like God, you need to disobey God. And as mankind disobeyed God, they also delivered dominion of the earth to the enemy. Things we don't know. That when I walk away from God's principles, I'm giving the enemy authority in my life. Satan said, everything you have, humans have delivered it to me, and I have the ability to give it to you. All I need you to do is bow down and worship me. Somebody say, speed up. Okay, I see the clock. Here we go. Three things the enemy will offer you. I will make you feel better. I'll give you something that will blow your mind. What do I get out of it? And then the last thing he said is, if you're really the son of God, jump off of this cliff because the Bible says that he won't let the son of God even dash his foot across a stone. Watch this, the Satan, Satan knows scripture. So he starts quoting Bible at Jesus. By the way, another quick detour. Every cult is founded on one scripture taken out of context. Every person with some type of minimal level of intelligence can find at least one Bible verse that they can manipulate into their own favor. Come on now. That's why the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established. I don't care. You found one little verse that tells you you don't have to go to church. No, no. What does the entire scripture say? And does it line up? We in the church. I know. I'm just using an example. Calm down. You get what I'm saying? So Satan will say, hey, 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 hey. Prove to me that you really are who you say you are. There's three things that the enemy will offer you when you're overwhelmed with stress. I can make you feel better. I can give you something that you really want. Or I can make people think that you're all that. How do I feel? What do I get? How am I viewed? How do I feel? What do I get? And how I'm viewed? And any time, the decisions I make in life are based on how it makes me feel. What do I get out of this? Or how will I be viewed as a result of it? I understand I'm making a decision from the enemy's camp. Here's the Bible said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. This is getting real heavy, right? We're going to laugh in a second, but it's going to get a little heavier. Here we go. For all that is in the world. Here's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize in church. That there are two approaches to life. There's God's approach, and then there's the world's approach. Approach, leave the verse up, to the same thing. So there's two approaches to marriage. There's two approaches to money. There's two approaches to raising kids. There's two approaches to your faith. He said, here's the world's approach, the lust of the flesh, how it makes me feel. The lust of the eyes, I want that. And the pride of life, what do people think about me? It said, none of this is of God. All of it is of the world. The Living Bible says it this way. 
It says, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's good. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, or wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out, but whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. I don't know why I'm slowing down to this level, but we're going to be there. So if I'm approaching my marriage from a worldly mindset, the only reason my wife exists is to make me feel good. Come on now. And the second she doesn't make me feel good is the second this marriage isn't what I signed up for. Or if I'm approaching my marriage from what do I get out of it? Everything about us together is what's the next goal we're going after. I, I, I want to get this and I want to do this and I want to accomplish this and this and this and this. Or if I'm approaching my marriage from how am I viewed, this, who are you talking to? I ain't no child, I'm a grown man. Come on now. And without even realizing it, we approach our careers with how it makes me feel. It don't pay you nothing, but I feel so accomplished and so, I mean, can't pay the bills, but I mean, I feel like I'm making a change. <laughs> You're broke. You need a better job. Come, come on now. It's amazing how many people will jump ship because they can't see the next goal to accomplish. Not really. The God is saying, if you had just stayed there, I was getting ready to open a door that you did not see coming. Or how does this make me? Can I really get in trouble? It's amazing how people will decide their church not by what will push me towards the purpose of God on my life, but how does it make me feel? Let's try to make it spiritual. What do my kids get out of it? And what title do you have for me, Pastor? Ain't nobody said no amens. I might be preaching to y'all. <laughs> Somebody go a little deeper. Can I take another level? Out of the three, how it makes me feel, what do I get out of it, how am I perceived? The enemy has all three tools, but each person has a propensity to one. Does that make sense? There's three ways that the enemy will attack, but every individual at Baltimore, Flowers, Columbia, Beta, you all have a propensity to one. Are you having fun? Can I take it another step? And because in church we are so good at judging other people, we have made judgment a scientific art. That it's amazing how we can look down at other people for the propensity that they struggle with simply because that's not my it. Are you tracking with me? And we feel so justified when someone strays from the things of God in that area because we say, I would never do that. And you wouldn't because that's not your DNA. You would do that. Go a little further. You people. You're so emotional. I mean, you're just up and you're down. And I mean, depression and anxiety and insomnia. What is insomnia? When I close my eyes, I sleep. You're always angry. You're always sad. You're always up. And you know who says that? A person who's goal-oriented. Yeah. And they're not feelings-oriented. Yeah. And because they're not feelings-oriented, that's not where the enemy attacks them. Yeah. Every personality has a strength, and every personality has a weakness, and you got to know your strength to maximize your strength, but you got to know your weakness to close the door on the enemy. Come on, let's see if anybody got any type of faith and self-confidence. Can all my emotional people, can you just wave at me? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Can I tell you the great thing about being a feeler and how it makes me feel? People who live life based on how they feel, they know what they feel and they know what other people feel. 
And because they know what other people feel, they're tied in and connected to the feelings of others. And they make people feel seen. And because they feel seen, I'm committed to you because you see me, you know me. There is nothing like a feeler that will always have an army of people behind them that will cut somebody on their behalf. I got me a crew. I got people that have my back and I have their back. This, I'm not a feeler, by the way. That's the great thing about, can I tell you the bad thing about feelers? If you ain't feeling like it, Hey, it's Monday morning. Time to go to work. I'm not feeling it. Hey, the Bible says a righteous man overlooks an offense. I don't feel like it. The Bible says a man that can't control his feelings is like a city without walls. Yeah, but I'm going to follow my... Feelings. Feelings are amazing helpers. They're a horrible master. Now, here's what my feelers say. You're so materialistic. You always notice what someone's wearing. You always notice in cars. You always want a bigger house. You always want to eat at a nicer restaurant. You always want to go on this vacation and that and this. You're so, you're just, you're shallow. You like stuff. You know what kind of people say you like stuff, you're wrong? Feelers and people who care about their reputation. Because stuff is not their motivation. They look down on people who it is. Now, I'm a stuffs guy. I like stuffs. I like shiny stuff. I like bright stuff. I like expensive stuff. I really like fast stuff. I... So whenever it's you, you got to think of the positive way to say it and the negative way to say it. Can can I give you the positive way? Us stuff people, we're goal-oriented. We see something and we go after it. So when we wake up in the morning and we see a goal in front of us, but we don't feel like it, guess what we do? We put our shoes on and we go after it because I don't live my life based on feelings. I live my life based on the goal that's ahead of me. Come on, where's my people? Perception matters. What, how pe- nobody's going to say yes to this one. How, how people see this. Uh, hey, uh, I, 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 if you think of a positive way to say it, everybody admits to it. But if you say a negative way, nobody's going to cop to it. Um, how do I say this? Um, how, how many people making your life matter is a big deal to you? Like impacting people and helping people. And, come on, you know I'm setting you up. That's a pastor. I don't care what you say. I ain't raising my hand because it's going to be bad. So watch this, I, 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 I'm a what do I get out of it type of guy, I'm a goals type of guy. I'm not necessarily a reputation in people's, okay, let me say it the way I really gotta say it. I don't care what nobody think about me. But watch this, as a leader, if you need a cheer squad to do something that's never been done before, you'll never get started. So part of the strength of my personality is I don't need a raw, raw crew that can see where God is taking me or is excited about it. I just need a word from God and I can go after it. The downside of my personality is because I'm goals oriented and not necessarily feelings oriented, it's easy for me not to acknowledge the feelings of others. Come on now. Any goal oriented people that done ran over a few people to get to that goal. Come on, this is what goal-oriented people say. By any means, you notice how you end up in jail, right? It's not, it's not by any means necessary. Like, come on now. Come on, my, my, my reputation matters. For those people that, that your reputation matters, that's a good thing. You know why? You have what grandma calls decorum. What, or act right. You, you, you know how to carry yourself with excellence. You're, you're mindful of how people view you. And by the way, God looks at the heart, but man looks at the outward appearance. Who are we leading, God or man? Huh? Oh. <laughs> we confused. Let's start over. Man looks at the 
looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Here on earth, giving you a context clue, who are we leading? Follow me. Man, you better not be leading God. That's how you end up. <laughs> you end up in a bad spot where you leading God. We're following God, leading people. Make sense? So the heart is not all that matters. Because the people who are following you will not know your heart until you give them an outward appearance worth following. Come on now. So people who influence in others and other people's opinion matters to them, they live a life that is worth following. I was flying out of town to preach a few weeks ago. It was a long flight. So I'm from Baltimore, y'all. I mean, I know I look like I'm not, but I'm from Baltimore. So I, I have my white socks on. I have my Nike flip-flops. I have my sweatpants and my hoodie pulled over. I'm walking out the door. My wife said, you look ghetto. <laughs> and you know what I said? I said, I don't care. I ain't going to see. <laughs> Showed up. I'm walking through the whole airport. Pastor? <laughs> I said, yep, that's me. People who care about perception, you carry yourself in a manner that is worth following. Can I give you the bad side of that? You will compromise your own values to make somebody happy around you. Every person I has a strength, every person I has a weakness, and here's what the enemy does. He knows your personality, he knows your weakness, and he will tempt you in a shortcut that's according to your personality. So there is a DNA propensity to addiction. And those of us who do not have that DNA propensity to addiction look down on people who struggle with addictions. You're weak. No, I'm just different the way that God made me. My difference has a weakness that I need to be mindful of and close the door to the enemy. All right, 45 minutes on point one. We're doing well. Point two, write this down. Diversions have one solution. The enemy will attack in three ways, but your out is in one way. The enemy will attack in three ways, but the out is in one way. Now, I said pray for the pastor. God's working on me. He's working on my heart. There's a lot of areas that I want him to work on. One of the areas I don't want him to work on is in my selection of movies. And let me clarify before I get in trouble. I don't watch lewd movies and salacious stuff and all that other good stuff. I do guard my heart and guard my eyes and amen. Somebody say, bless God. But I do love a good murder scene just once in a while. I mean, I love war. I love pillaging. I love assassins. Listen, if I'm watching a movie and we're five minutes in and everybody's still alive, not interested and got nothing to do with me, I like the 30 seconds in, someone caught it. We're going to spend the next three hours trying to figure out who it. Some of y'all like me. God's still working on all of us. But all the movies I watch, they tend to have one scene in all of them. You've seen a movie with that scene. It's the scene where they have the armored car full of gold or full of money. And they're trying to rob that armored car. They get together with their strategy and say, oh, all right, we can't rob them at the bank. They're, guard they're expecting it there. How... Let's make sure that there's a diversion in the road. We'll create a car accident, a pothole, something to make the armored car turn off. You saw the same movie I saw. And when they go down that alley, we'll get them there. That's movie number one. The second movie is we're not trying to steal the armored car. We're trying to kidnap that person. So they got the military vehicle up front. They got the military one behind. There's the limo. Denzel's driving. Little girl's in the back. <laughs> you go home and watch that movie. And they're like, we can't take them on the main road, so here's what we'll do. We'll blow up the car in front, blow up the car behind, and then they'll go down this alley and we'll... Somebody say movie number two. This is too much movies, but I'm having too much fun. I don't know if you are. Movie number three. I don't want your money, and I'm not going to take you. I just need you to sit there for about three minutes, because this is about to be the last three minutes of your life. I just need that car to come to a stop. I got a sniper up there on the hill. This is my favorite one, because they get the little old lady. You know the little old lady with the shopping cart? And she go across the street like, <laughs> and that car comes and stops. Like, move, move. <laughs> the whole point is, I'm gonna put a fictitious block 
barricade in front of you, to divert you from the path that you're on, to get you to a path where you're more susceptible to destruction. If you are a follower of God and your life feels like it's blocked, it's fictitious. Because if God be for me, what economy can be against me? It doesn't matter that the enemy is coming in like a flood because God will raise up a standard against me. So how do I know if the blockage in front of me is the enemy and I need to go through it or if it's God and I just need to be patient? How do I know if this shortcut is the enemy trying to trick me or it's God opening a door of breakthrough? Because I just said the enemy will bring you a new job, but so will God. Huh? So how do I know which one is God, which one's the enemy? Here's what I love. Bow down and worship me. We all know that sin, right? That's easy. Hey, uh, prove to me that you're God by jumping off this cliff. I don't know if that's sin, but I ain't jumping off nobody's cliff, so that one's out. The one that got me caught up is the stone into bread. Because turning the stone into bread is not sin. God was hungry, and his fast was over. So there's nothing wrong with turning, well, Satan told him to do it. Okay, you got me there. That is a kind of indication this ain't God. But other than that, there's nothing wrong with stone into bread. What's wrong with that? But here's how Jesus processed it. Satan said, if you are the son of God, turn this stone into a bread. Somebody say if. I fast forward or rewind to Luke chapter 3 where Jesus gets baptized and when he comes out of the water, the sky cracks open. God the Father speaks and said, this is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. Somebody say Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 4. If you are the son of God, prove it by turning this stone into bread. Okay, you are asking me to prove with my actions something that my father has already verified with his word. So now you're asking me to be redundant to what God has already said. And if I do that, it means that I don't really believe what God said. And I know that he sees me that way. But in order for me to believe it, I need you to see me that way. So it has nothing to do with the stone into bread and everything to do with my motive is to reiterate something that God already said. So here's what Jesus said. Turn the stone into bread. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. Everything that you see, I'll give it to you. It is written, you should worship none other than the Lord your God and serve him only. By the way, don't be so concerned about what you get that you're not paying attention to who you get it from. Because the right thing from the wrong source will cause you more pain than you ever thought. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. It is written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Somebody say, it is written. Say, it is written. Say, it is written. The only reason why God was able to expose the attack of the enemy is because he knew what was written. And every thought, every word, every motive that he had, he filtered it through scripture. This is me grabbing your face, saying if you don't know God's word for yourself, you won't be able to tell a shortcut from the enemy to efficiency from God. And you'll be shouting, God's given me a breakthrough. And it's not a breakthrough, it's a setup. Or you'll be one of them super spiritual people that see a demon behind every bush. God says, that's not a demon, that's a breakthrough. Psalm 119. Verse 96. Y'all with me? Y'all ready for this message to be over? That's the only thing you're allowed to say when a preacher is preaching. It's about time! <laughs> Verse 96. This is talking about the Bible. Give you point three, we're going to land and go go home and eat tuna fish sandwiches. All right, verse 96, here we go. Nothing is perfect except your word. This 119, Psalm 119, read it. It's talking about what the Bible is. The psalmist said, nothing is perfect except your word. The Bible is the only thing that's perfect. He said, oh, how I love them. I think about them all day long. Here's what he's saying. He said, God, I'm constantly filtering everything that comes out of my mouth, every decision, every motive through your word. He didn't say I'm reading my Bible every day. 
or all day. He said, I'm thinking, does this line up with scripture? So let me act it out and I'll come back to this verse. Somebody ticks you off. I, I'm a, give you a piece of my mind. Give me one second. Am I allowed to give a piece of my mind? Piece of my mind, piece of my mind, piece of my mind, piece of my mind. Ah, speak the truth. Let me tell. In love. Okay, 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 okay. I love you. Now let me tell. He says, I'm filtering everything that I do and I say all day long. I'm thinking, does this line up with scripture? Somebody say, I got it. Here's verse 98. Look what he says. He says, your scriptures make me wiser than my enemies because they are, your scriptures are my constant God. When I live according to God's word, I'm smarter than my enemies. Now we preach about enemies, we preach about haters, and I didn't know anything about it until this lawsuit I just got finished with, and now I got some enemies. What? We good. It's all great. We won. But anyway, just to say that. Okay. Calm down, calm down. So watch this. If you've ever had enemies, you know enemies often lie. Enemies often manipulate to get their way. And when your enemy is lying, it tempts you to lie. Because it can make you feel like they're getting away with their lies. But hear me, your enemy has to lie because they don't have God on their side. So they have to use every tactic that they can get. But because God is for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. And as long as you take the... Can I tell you what taking the high road is about? It's I just don't want to tick God off. Because he's the one that's fighting for me. This has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with I need to honor him so he can get you. So it says that make me wiser than my enemies. God's will go on right now. It says this. Yes, wiser than my teachers. It says God's word is better than experts. So experts will tell you, if you want to build wealth, keep all your money and don't spend it. Experts will tell you it is foolish to take 10% of your income and give it to God. How do you expect to build wealth giving your money away? Experts will say, don't tithe. Invest. Get real estate, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then start some nonprofit. You can write big checks one day when you're filthy rich. God's words say, oh, there's not an amen in this room. I'm preaching in the most non-tithing service of the day. That's our... That's all right. Good thing I'm not a people pleaser, right? I got a goal. All right. God's word says 90% with the favor of God on my life will always take me further than 100% with God's opposition. It says scripture will make you wiser than experts. Can I talk about your mama and then we're done? Well, I'm not me, not me, not me. Scripture. Verse 100. God's scriptures, they make me even wiser than the aged. You know what that means? Well, my mama told me that, well, my daddy said this is what a real man is. Can I really get in trouble? You know, us black people, we always. You know, white people, we. You know, as Hispanics, I was talking to a friend, us Hispanics, we always, whenever I put culture over scripture, I am taking a shortcut of the enemy and it will not take me to where I want to go. I don't care how you were raised. If it doesn't line up with scripture, you're not going to end up where you want to be. Y'all are waiting to see if I said something racist. Are we good? We good? Are we safe? I got through that one. I'm on the edge, but I'm good. I'm good. Will you? And what breaks my heart is how we will celebrate a cultural win, even though it's completely opposite to the word of God. But because one of my people made it, and they made it completely opposite to the things of God. He said, no, no, no. He said, it's God's word. And it goes on to say, his word will be a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. Purpose is a highway and scriptures are the lanes. You're safe on a highway as long as you stay in the lanes. The second you start to swerve over to the side, the second you're going to end up in a ditch or in a tree. It's got, no, nope, I want to do that, but that's not what the word says. Nope, I want to do that, not what the word says. All right, last thing is this, write this down. 
Destiny awaits the faithful. Destiny awaits the Detours come in three ways. There's one solution to diversions. But if I'm gonna get to the destiny that God has for me, it's gonna require me, me to be faithful. Satan said, you do this, I'll make you feel better. You do this, I'll give you everything that you see. You do this, people are going to think that you're all that in a bag of chips. But Satan is not a creator. He's only a repurposer. So watch this. Satan offered Jesus, and he's offering you and I, something that Jesus has already offered us. And it's not an offer from Jesus, it's a guarantee. And one of the reasons why the enemy gets us to go his way is because he's manipulated our minds in what we think God wants from us. We don't think God wants us to be happy, we think God just wants us to be holy. I don't care if you're happy, just be holy. Come on now. If we were to be honest, we would think in our mind that God would say, you shouldn't care about cars. You shouldn't care about goals. You shouldn't care about stuff. How shallow are you? You have me. Why do you care about stuff? That's what we think the voice of God sounds like. We think God would say, what do you care about your reputation and other people? I think that you're special. And the only reason we believe that is because we've listened to what the enemy has said about God, not what God has said about himself. Because here's what God said. He said, a good name is more valuable than gold. He looked at Abraham and he didn't say, Abraham, I'm going to make you holy. He said, I'm going to make your name great. If God didn't care about your reputation, why would he make somebody's name great? God looked at the early church. He said, I freely gave you my own son. Do you not think I will not also freely give you everything else? He said, ask of me and I will give you the nations. There's nothing wrong with possessions. God wants you to have possessions. He just doesn't want possessions to have you. And it doesn't matter how you feel. You know that church, y'all was talking about the flesh, the flesh, the carnal nature. Do you know what God thinks about the flesh? First of all, he fashioned and formed your flesh. And then after he fashioned and formed your flesh, he said, I love it so much, I want to make your flesh my temple. If the flesh was so bad, why would God want to live here? He said, I love the flesh. It's amazing. Just don't let it be your master. Make sure it's under your control and that your cravings don't control God says, everything that you want, Union Church, hear me. Union Church, hear me. Everything that you want, God wants for you. You're wrestling. Should I go back and get that master's degree? God wants you to have that master's degree. Man, I just want to make something of my life. God wants you to make something of your life. Man, I'm tired of going from depression to depression, from, from struggle to struggle, from pain to pain. I just need like two days where I can breathe. God wants you to breathe. But he said, I want you to get there on my path. Because the path that the enemy has for you is full of robbers and thieves and you'll never get to your destination. So God gives us his path in Philippians chapter two. He said, your attitude should be the attitude of Jesus, who being God himself, gave up his heavenly reputation and came to earth as a human. Not only did he give, come to earth as a human, he gave up all the wealth of being the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He, he gave up, his, he submitted even to death, death on the cross. Here's what the Bible says. It says, because Jesus took the painful route, took the long route. By the way, y'all know there was a shortcut, right? It's called the flood. Kill them all, start over. Never thought about, did you? He's creator God. He could have wiped the earth and started with a whole group of new people. He said, no, no, I'm gonna take the long way because redemption is so much better than destruction. 
It says, because Jesus took the pain of the cross, God said, I raised him up. Somebody say, he's going to do that to me. I seated him in heavenly places. Somebody say, he's done that for me. He said, and I've given him a name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue can earth. And watch this. And he said, everything in the heavens and everything on the earth. What did Satan promise him? He said, I'll give you everything on the earth. Jesus said, no worries. My father already gave it to me. He said, everything on earth shall declare that he is Christ the Lord. Hear me. There is a godly reward on the other side of endurance. There is victory on the other side of pain. There is a promised land on the other side of I'm not taking the easy. You listen, your marriage may be in the worst season it has ever been. Don't take the easy way out. You may be raising some teenagers and said, I could put them on Craigslist. You know what happens if you don't kill them? They'll make you some grandbabies and you're gonna be like, it was worth it. I'm so glad I kept you. Any area of your life, there's a shortcut. It's not gonna end you up where you think it is though. But if you'll stay in the wilderness that God placed you in, I promise you there's more on the other side than you ever thought possible. Father God, we're grateful, we're thankful. Not because we feel good, but because you are good. God, some of us have gone through seasons we wish we didn't have to. Some of us are in seasons that we wish we could get out of. Some of us are going into some wilderness experiences. But God, you're in control. God, you're testing us. You're, you're proving us. You're humbling us because you're getting ready to bless us. Just where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you could pray this with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just take this moment, allow God to, ah, I just sense with all my heart, some of you are getting ready to make a decision tomorrow. That it wasn't sinful, it was just a shortcut. God is saying, no, 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 no. There's a reward for those who endure. I want to pray for those of you at Flowers in Baltimore, BWI here in Columbia. That if you'd be honest, you would say that God is not the center of my decisions. He's not the center of my life. I am. The bad news is you being the center of you is guaranteed to get you to a place that you don't want to be. The Bible says ultimately you'll spend eternity in hell separated from God. The good news is God is standing right next to you in this moment, asking, will you allow him into your life? Yeah, it includes dying to yourself, but oh my goodness, the life you get to live on the other side. So wherever you find yourself, you say, Pastor, I'm ready to die to me so that I can live for him. Right where you're sitting, can you pray this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me for seeing me, for having a great future for my life. Thank you for dying on the cross, for taking my punishment so that I can be made new. Today, I surrender. I give you all of me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on, church. Can you celebrate for every single person that...